God is so good. God is so good. All right. So I'm really, I'm honored and, and privileged to be able to bring the word to you this morning. Of course, maybe some of you are thinking, oh no, the youth pastor's preaching. Maybe, well, maybe sometimes that means you get to go to lunch a little earlier this morning. <laughs> Billy, you're fired. <laughs> so we, for the last kind of five weeks, we've been going over the parables of Jesus, unlocking the teachings of Jesus. And so I'm honored to be able to be behind, as Pastor Gary says, the sacred desk. Oh, wait, this one's a little smaller. I guess they gave me the baby pulpit this morning because I'm not a big boy yet. So, but for the last five weeks, we've been talking about these parables. And just a quick review to remind you what we've been talking about. So in week one, we talked about the persistent widow. So Pastor Gary brought that message. And then week two, Pastor Billy brought us the, the message of the wise and foolish builders. And then week three, we talked about the loss with Pastor Gary. Then a couple weeks ago, uh, Zach back there, he gave an awesome message about talents and another way to look at it. And isn't it great to see these, these, these students step up and do these things? I was super proud of him. I'm always proud of him when he does these things. But it was a really a unique take on the parable of the talents. And now uh, last week, Pastor Gary gave a great and awesome message. It's probably one, my favorite one he's given out of the, the parable so far of the soil. And so this week, we are talking about the Good Samaritan. And so we're, we're going to look up, see how the Good Samaritan ties into this story of Jesus. We're going to be breaking down, we're going to learn three th practical things that we can learn from the Good Samaritan. And maybe it's something you may, may have never looked at before. So, Father God, we thank you for this time that we can come and worship you in song, Lord, that we can worship you in our singing, Lord. And now as we transition into this time of worship through the hearing the word, Lord, I ask that this vessel that you put on this stage this morning, that you make it about you, Lord, that you get the glory this morning, Lord, and that you're preparing the hearts of your people, Lord, to hear what you have them to hear this morning, Lord. And we praise you, we, and we ask all these th things in your son's name. Amen. So if you don't mind, we're going to open up our Bibles, because a good message, it needs to be based out of the Word, right? So we're going to open up our Bibles to Luke chapter 10, and we're going to start in verse 25, and we're going to go all the way to verse 37. And then th those of you that forgot your Bible, I'll have it on the Magical Sky Bible up above us. I like to call it the Sky Bible, or those of you watching online, it'll be, I, I got super fancy this week and put it online for you as well. So what it says is, see, it says, and behold, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But I guys want you to really hold on to this next part right now. But he, desiring to justify himself, I want you to hold on and maybe underline that in your Bible this morning, seeking to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side of the road. So likewise, the second person that shows up on the scene, is he said it's a a Levite. And when he came to the place and he saw him, he also passed on the other side of the road. Then there was a Samaritan man. As he journeyed, he came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? Jesus asked the lawyer. 
And the lawyer said, the man that showed him mercy. And then Jesus just ends it with, it says, you go and do likewise. So whenever I read that first part, when I told you to hold on to the justify himself, but we look, when we look at that first part in, in, in Luke, kind of whenever I say, when I hear it read or said, when Jesus asks him, how do you read it? I, I, I don't know if it's just me, but I feel like he's just being super sarcastic. Well, how do you read the law? How do you interpret the law? And let's be even going a little deeper. Maybe he's even saying, how do you twist my father's words? How do you twist what my father said? We're going we're gonna to read Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17 through 18. This is verbatim what this man said. This was what the law was. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And a little side note, you'll notice every time that God speaks his laws and speaks his commandments, he ends it with, I am the Lord. And there's a reason for that. He's not just saying because they forgot who his name was, but you would think, you know, the Jewish people probably forgot who he was because of how many times they turned his back on him. But the reason why he keeps saying, I am the Lord, I view it as he's saying, this is the final say. This is the law. This is final. Do as I say. Because we all know there's consequences when we don't do what God says. So, but then we look at the world around us. We see, like all, all growing up, I was taught in school the golden rule. Who can tell me the golden rule? All I heard was, rah, 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 rah. <laughs> that's all I heard. But it said, do unto others as you do unto you. You would think that when you go around the world and you see that taught, you would think that you'd see love around the world, you'd see peace, but we don't. We don't see people following this law. We see all these people arguing on social media over the stupidest little things. I don't know about you just sometimes, sometimes I just like to, like that little meme, I, I, I love memes, and a meme is just a weird picture with words. Um, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about. But I love the meme that has a little, like, the picture of Michael Jackson eating popcorn. And I, I love to sometimes read those comments and be like, okay, what, what stupid things are we going to get into this morning? Or, or whatever. And sometimes I'm the stupid person that's arguing with someone on Facebook or on Instagram. Because sometimes we get caught up in that moment. But you see all this division, all this strife between people. And instead of treating people as themselves, what, what we kind of see, we see that people are being haters. They're not living, they're not loving their neighbors as themselves. I kind of think, view it as they're drinking that self-haterade. They're drinking self-haterade instead of loving one another. So, this, 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 this verse that we went through in Leviticus, this is what the lawyer quotes directly. And he answered correctly, because you're supposed to love your neighbor. So my big idea this morning is the Good Samaritan demonstrates Jesus' love, his mercy, and compassion. So I'll state it again. Your big, my big idea is that Good Samaritan demonstrates Jesus' love, mercy, and compassion. See, Jesus' answer, it paints a picture to live how to live our lives like Jesus. Jesus is painting a picture by the good Samaritan, how he reacts to the situation. But we need to set this, the story, we need to set the scene for this, because maybe you, you've read the story and you're like, well, I'm not sure why this matters. Like I, don't, like, I know who a Jewish person is, but maybe you don't know who a Samaritan person is. So the Jewish people and the Samaritan people, their lineage tracks back all the way to the original split of the northern and southern Jewish tribes. And so they're the same people. They come from the same origin, but since the split of those tr the northern and southern tribes, there is this huge hate. This, the hate between these two peoples is grand. It's, it, it's crazy. There is, 
the Jewish people would refer to the Samaritans as a herd instead of a nation. That's, that's just rude and hateful. To be, consider a people a herd, basically what they're saying in that moment is that instead of calling them a people, a real person, they're saying that they're just a bunch of wild animals feeding off other people's stuff. Then there's an old Jewish proverb that says that a piece of bread given by a Samaritan is dirtier than a, the skin of a swine. Sheesh! That, that's hateful. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how much you have to hate someone and say, you are so, to be so disgusted by someone, you are so disgusting that you make a pig look clean. That's how much they hated the Samaritan people. They're calling them pigs. Because anyone that owns livestock knows that a pig is dirty and stinky. Anytime you go to the state fair and they're showing you know, all the, all the animals, you go look at the pig's pen, and it's, it smells. And so they're saying they're just like the pigs. See, there are some hostile Gentiles, which there was a lot in Jesus' ministry, that there's hostile Gentiles in John 8, 48, and it says, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? They're saying this to Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. They're saying, they're trying to tear down Jesus. Throughout his entire ministry on earth, they were always trying to trip him up, make him, make him not be the Savior, be who he was created to be. And see, they hated him so much that they basically were calling him a de de demon-possessed, dirty pig man, essentially. I don't know about you, but I couldn't, I couldn't do that. Call someone that's here to help me a dirty pig man. But knowing this history, this animosity between the two people, the, the Jewish people and the Samaritan, makes this parable even much more powerful because it's safe to assume that the man that was gravely injured, who was half dead in this story, it's, it's safe to assume that he was a Jewish man because he was coming from Jerusalem to Jericho. And actually, the Samaritans were not allowed in the city of Jerusalem. And so it's safe to assume that the man coming from Jerusalem was a Jewish man. So we're going to read Luke 10. We're going to start in verse 30 again. It says, A man was going down from Jerusalem, and he fell among the robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. I want you to remember that. Half dead you got to be pretty messed up to be half dead. Not by chance a priest, he was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, the Levite passed, went by him on the other side of the road. But the Samaritan, he journeyed and came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. So the, we have three things that we can learn from this passage from the Good Samaritan. So number one is the Good Samaritan represents compassion. So if you're following along in your talk notes, that's your first one. Is the Good Samaritan represents compassion. See, the first man, he can't be bothered. He sees the person that's hurt, and he goes to the other side of the road. And what he did was intentional. See, the first man was a priest, like we said. And so maybe his reasoning was, well... I'm on my way to church. I got my good clothes on. I'm supposed to do all these, all these stuff. And, and back then, that's when, well, you know, if they got bloody or dirty, they were considered impure. And so maybe he was just like, I don't have time for this. And so you, but you would assume that a man of God would stop and help this man. But no, he can't be bothered. And then the second man was a Levite. And maybe this morning you don't know what a Levite is. They are descendants of the tribe of Levi. And a Levite's role within the temple is they would sing psalms during church services. So it would be like our singers this morning. It would be like one of our singers. They do maintenance and construction on the temples. They were judges. They were teachers. So maybe this, 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 this Levite, maybe he was late for guard duty. 
because this was another thing that they did in that time. They guarded the temple. Maybe he was late, and for the same reason, he just can't be bothered. He doesn't have time. Maybe he's late for music practice. Maybe he's late, and he's like, I don't have time for you this time. And they, but they don't have that compassion. They just pass by without blinking an eye. But then the third man, he comes, and it's a Samaritan, and he stops to help him. And most of us assume that this, when we read the story, you would think that in that moment, the Samaritan would see this Jewish man half dead, and he would take his opportunity to take revenge and finish the job that the robber started. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes, you know, there's another saying that goes around the world, and it's probably why it's so filled with hate, is, or, well, I'll just quote Medea right now this morning, get the godders before they got you. Maybe they, in that moment, maybe some of us were like, we kicked the man while he's down because you, you called me a dirty pig. You called me not a nation. You called me not a people. <laughs> See, he had compassion. He was filled with compassion in that moment. He cared about the man's suffering. He cared about what he was going through in that moment. So how many times do we look the other way in our daily lives? How many times do we not show that we care to one another? We don't show compassion. Maybe it's when we go to Walmart. And on our way out, everyone knows that when you go to Walmart, there's at least two homeless people, one either by the Lord's Chicken at Chick-fil-A, over by that exit, or over by uh, the gas station on that end. How many times do we look at them and maybe say, well, maybe if you just got a job and stopped being who you are, you wouldn't be on this corner right now? Or maybe how many times have we gone out to Tulsa and seen the, the stuff that we see out there with the homeless people, and you're like, if you would just do right, if you would just get off the drugs, you would be better. But instead, we should take compassion in that moment. You see, see how many times has life in your life, how many times have you been beaten down with life's crud? How many times have you put yourself in a spiritual jam because of your choices? But guess who comes every single time when you call for help? Every single time that you call for help, you're saying, God, I messed up! God, I messed up! He comes every single time because he has conf compassion for his people. He comes every single time. No matter what, he will come and he will come. There's nothing that you can do that make him stop caring about your struggles. There's nothing we can do he comes every single time. It's just like the, the, in Judges, because I'm going through a, a series through Judges with the youth for the next month. Sorry, kids, you're in Judges for a month. But I'm going through the series, and we see the Jewish people have turned their back on God, but every time they call for help, He still comes. That means God is still going to come. He's still the same God that He was yesterday in the book of Judges, in the book of Genesis, all the way to the end of the book at Revelation. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the second thing that we, can, that we can learn from the Good Samaritan, so the first thing that he represents is compassion. And the second thing that he represents is mercy. The second thing that we learn, so if you're following along, that's your second point. You might be thinking, well, isn't mercy and compassion the same thing? Isn't it similar? Yes, but it's we're going to take a step deeper in a look into this mercy thing because mercy also means forgiveness. See, we talked about how we, when the Samaritan looked up on him, maybe, you know, some of us in our flesh would just exact that revenge. We, we talked about it already that he would be like, oh man, this is my opportunity to get my, to get my revenge. But there's this powerful moment of forgiveness. Yeah, it's not really said within that verse. It doesn't say that the, the Samaritan says, I forgive you. But in that moment, I feel like he had mercy upon him because maybe this was the same man, maybe two days ago outside the walls of Jerusalem, was the same man that called him a bunch of names and insulted him and did all these horrible things to him. But in that we don't know. But in that moment, he showed a powerful moment of forgiveness. See, 
It takes a power, it takes a lot to do something for someone that hates who you are as a person. It takes a lot to do something for someone who'd rather see you probably dead. Who would call you a dirty pig. Who call you all these ugly names. In that moment, I believe forgiveness happened. There was this healing that happened in that moment. And see how many times has maybe God shown you forgiveness? How many times has he shown you mercy? Hi, computer. See, how many times have you shown you mercy and forgiveness? Maybe when you flipped off that car and cussed them out on the way here to church because they cut you off. Maybe it's when you, did the Lord show you forgiveness when you said those rude and hateful things to your server at lunch after church because you were hangry and you didn't get what you wanted. You wanted hash browns, but they gave you grits instead. I don't know. I don't know what you get after church. They, gave you, they didn't give you what you wanted. But in that moment, what is it that God has forgiven you for? Maybe it's when you, you look at something you're not supposed to. Maybe it's when you argue with your wife or your husband. Maybe it's when you screw up in life. But every time, God is there to forgive you. No matter how many times we mess up, there is nothing we can do about it. Because God will forgive us every time. But we have to come running after Him. God shows us mercy and forgiveness every single day. Just like the Good Samaritan in that moment. Jesus is showing us in that moment that He forgives us for what we do. That He shows mercy to us daily. It's never, like I said, it never changes. God has shown us mercy after mercy, forgiveness after forgiveness every single day. So the Good Samaritan, he represents compassion. He represents mercy. And the third one, if you're following along with me, is the Good Samaritan represents sacrifice. He represents sacrifice. See, in verse 34, it paints this picture of sacrifice. So we go into it and it says, he went to him and bound up his wounds. So like I, it, we, it says in the Bible that he was half dead. So to be half dead, you're pretty messed up. He probably's got like, you know, those of you in the medical field probably can see what he's going through. He's busted wide open probably on his head. He's probably, he probably got, uh, since these were robbers, they were thugs, they probably shanked him a couple times. And so he's probably bleeding. He's not doing good. So the, the man, the Samaritan, takes out his own medical supplies and he bandaged him up. In that moment, it was a very risky thing for him to do because the road from Jerusalem to Jericho was very dangerous because, as we saw, this, this Jewish man got robbed. Maybe on the way to wherever this man was going, maybe he gets robbed. But now he's used up his medical supplies. He's used up his supply for the trip on this man that's half dead to a man that probably hates him. And then he even goes a step further because maybe in that moment we're like, all right, you're good, all right, you're bandaged up, I got you all taken care of, go on about your business. So no, he goes a step further. He then pours oil and wine on his wounds. See, back then they didn't have our fancy sanitizer stuff and um, fluids and all that stuff. They used oil and wine to sanitize the wound to, uh, to keep off infections from them. So I'm sure that stuff wasn't cheap either. I mean, we go to the store right now and you look at the price of wine, you look at the price of oil, it's probably pretty expensive. But we look in that moment, he sacrifices his supplies in that moment. But then he even goes a step further. So he sanitized his wounds, he's bandaged him up, then he goes a step further, he has his animal, or some translation, his beast, he then picks up the man, probably getting dirty and filthy because there's no telling how long this man was laying on the ground. He picks him up and puts him on his animal and then gives up his right and his privilege to, walk, to ride on his animal. Instead, he walks alongside to, work, to the place that they're going. And there, there's no telling how far that place was. There's no telling how far he had to walk because we know that there was, when they traveled, they traveled for long ways at times. So the, the Samaritan in that moment sacrificed his privilege and, and, and right to ride his own animal into town. And then he even goes a step further. He could just like lay him outside of the town that he was going to, but then he takes him to an inn. 
and he spends the day and probably the night with him nursing his wounds. How many of you have taken care of someone that's really sick or really injured? Raise your hands. How much work was that? It was a lot of work. It takes time. It takes energy. It's like dealing with a baby. They need all of your attention in that moment. Or maybe it's like your sick husband, like me. They're really needy when they're sick. You're, but they, they need all this attention. They need their, 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 their bandages changed. They need food. They need water. They need to recover. And so he spends all day and all night with this man nursing his wounds. But then he goes a step further. He then, as he leaves the next day, he goes to the innkeeper and gives him two denarii and says, use this to continue the care for this man. And then he says, when I come back, if it was more than what I gave you, I will pay it. See, two denar a, a denarius was a day's wages for a laborer back then. Can, can you imagine? He worked hard for that money. We work hard for our money, right? We work hard to make a living. But in that moment, he was willing to sacrifice what he had to make sure that this man he doesn't even know got taken care of. He made sure that this man was being taken care of. Even though the tradition and the, and, and the history shows that this man is an enemy. That this man is someone you do not help. How many times in our own lives have we turned our back on God, we've cursed Him, and yet He still sacrifices for us he still gives us freely a gift. And then think about Jesus. Jesus is the one talking in this moment. Jesus is the one talking in this moment. Think about what he sacrificed for you. What did he sacrifice? He sacrificed his entire literal life. He was murdered on the cross for you. He was the ultimate sacrifice to you. He was... A, all throughout his ministry, he's alluding to this ultimate sacrifice that he's about to make to, so that you could spend eternity with God and with him. See, what Jesus is trying to teach us in this moment is that we should be sacrificial in everything we do. If you have to give up lunch today to help a homeless man, do it. If you have to give up your time before you make, because like, like later today, I have to go to work maybe at, at four o'clock. And Maybe I, instead of going doing what we have planned, maybe God has something else planned for me. God, that's not a challenge. But maybe, but maybe in that moment, God's asking you to sacrifice because there's something bigger and better that he has for you. Because he's calling us to sacrifice. So as we get ready to wrap up this evening, morning, I'm sorry, I'm used to preaching to nighttime. See, Jesus, he, he's teaching us this, and he's saying to us that we should show compassion, we should show mercy, and we should live sacrificial, sacrificial lives in everything that we do. See, the Good Samaritan is a representation of what Jesus Christ expects us to live in our daily lives. See, how many times has God sacrificed for you, like I said? And so at this time, I'd like everyone to stand as we get ready to wrap up. In the, how many times has God sacrificed? You see, in this moment, God is saying that it's time to come home. It's time to stop living self-serving lies and start serving others like we're called to do. See, the Good Samaritan, he showed the ultimate service in that, in that time. He sacrificed. He showed compassion to a person that probably hated his guts. And he, and he showed mercy to him.